Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome once again to uh, another ISNAD uh, discussion. Um, today we are going to be continuing uh, with Ahlul Bayt and Ashaba, uh, the roadmap for unity and mutual understanding. Uh, tonight's episode is a continuation and extension of the discussion we had previously in the aftermath of the release of the controversial uh, film, Late of Heaven. So today we are going to be deliberating on the book Risala Salam Madhabi, Memorandum of Religious Peacemaking, written by the great Kumi Shia reformist scholar, uh, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Hubbullah. Peacemaking. However, uh, we will have a link uh, to the English translation of the specific portion we're going to be discussing will be added to the description so that the viewers can access it directly, um, allowing them to follow tonight's proceedings uh, more clearly. So um, this book uh, written uh, by Sheikh Haider Khubullah has proposed, he has proposed uh, this impressive uh, roadmap for peace, unity and mutual understanding between the Shias and the Sunnis. Uh, and with his characteristic wisdom, deep insight and remarkable uh, uh, foresightedness. And um, what uh, I want to do, and um, I mean, this is what I want uh, the panelists today uh, to be able to share their insight and their perspectives of what um, has been written in this book. So let me start with the first question. And uh, so the first point, which is raised uh, in the pages uh, that, that are shared uh, is to do uh, with upholding the right of Muslims. Um, this includes having their own independent ijtihad in matters of history, uh, as opposed to just blindly following or parroting whatever historical narrative seems most popular within the given uh, sectarian paradigm. Uh, what would your understanding be of this? And maybe personally, what is your stance on this matter? Floor is open. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, brother Smith, I'll, inshallah, I'll start. Just rephrase the question for me once more, Khi. Rephrase that question once more. Okay, so um, so as he's writing, it's about, about upholding the rights of Muslims. And this mm. includes being able to do independent ijtihad mm. as a Muslim, rather than blindly following historical narratives that is popular. So mm. what's your understanding of this? Yeah, so uh, as in, to, to keep it uh, brief and uh, concise for our viewers, uh, essentially, uh, Sheikh Haider Habullah, half of the law, Allah preserve him, is basically saying that being bought into a narrative is um, not something that you have to accept as ijtihad. You do your own independent research and you see where you end up. Because if naturally, if we're all about just, again, this is my view, if we're all about just following something you're born into, then um, Reform can't work You know al not have their view Our Shia have our view Within the Shia There's difference of opinions Within al There's difference of opinions You have to Have the right To research And do ijtihad And come to a conclusion Now another Muslim Can disagree with your conclusion um, But I believe that Even if the conclusion He feels is Extremely wrong but at the same time, like the same way, you know, uh, a Sunni could disagree with a Shi'i, a Shi'i could disagree with a Sunni, and the different type of spectrums amongst them. But I think evidently, it should be something that should be based on fairness and something that you should be researching independently rather than fa blindly following something you've been born into. Because like this, you will never reach a conclusion that is something that we can build forward from. You will just keep parroting and narrating what you were taught the other side will keep narrating what they're taught and you'll never be able to go forward because you'll all just be brainwashed. Once you reach your independent conclusions and you present your evidences, inshallah, let, let the evidences speak for itself and we'll see whose ijtihad is stronger on the issue. This is not a matter of disbelief or anything like that, unless you naturally, you come out with conclusions that are completely anti-Quranic, of course, which I can discuss later. Uh, Sayyid Raza, I want to ask a very short question to you. If you get a Shia to tell him to research his ijtihad, he's going to go and gravitate towards Shia books. Mm. How would you counter that particular thing? I mean, what would be the better way of doing it? Yeah, I think, I think 
I think th th this requires a bit of tafsil. And um, what well, I will give you an ishara on this issue, uh, Brother Samir, and the, 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 the people that of intellect and the people of knowledge know this, that I think we need to be honest about our historical sources and about our legacy as Muslims and realize that Shiism is built on an inherent belief. It's built on something. Naturally, your resources and your kind of pool, your source pool of knowledge is still limited. So example, if already you've got a narrative and you look within a pool and your pool's already got only one narrative, you're not going to find too many differences in your pool. We at Al-Islah, like Sayyid Ali Hur found that narration of Umm Khalid, we can show you gems, we can show you little gems so you can connect the dots. But naturally, if you're only going to look inside your own pool, generally the conclusions are not going to be too different because you're only looking inside your pool. Muslim history is bigger than Shia literacy. And our scholars accept that at a, at a practical level. Look at a hadith of Ghadir and hadiths that we talk about constantly. Most of these sources that we narrate, Akhi, are, albeit they could be, they, they are in Shia sources, but the mainstream books is where the real kind of pool of knowledge is. And I think that without their sources, to just say, oh, well, that's a Shia book, that's a Sunni book, I don't think you can even find biography of the Prophet without going into Sunni sources. So if you want to play this, you can, but I just don't think it's a constructive way of looking at things. And I think even scholars on a practical level, they don't apply this. They might use it when it comes to sectarianism, but practically, if you were to dismiss all the sources apart from Shias, you can't even get the biography of the Prophet. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Sister Eva, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I think if we're going down the idea of blind following, if we call it another word, imitation or following someone, I think it's really important to mention the doctrine of deed. And um, when Shias, most Shias nowadays, um, they, if they don't know something or if they don't know about a certain issue, they refer it to their mushtahid who's best qualified, who's reached a certain level of ijtihad. Um, I think there's this presupposition that you have to reach a certain level of ishtihad because you can't carry it out yourself because you don't have access to certain sources and I think that in itself cuts off the root of any uh, independent thinking and any independent reasoning and I know from a personal experience and I'm sure many viewers and most of the panelists here can um, can understand where I'm coming from but from a very young age in our madrasas in our institutions where we go to we're taught that you need to do taqlid, otherwise, you know, you, you essentially, you can't be uh, a Shia if you don't do taqlid of a certain person who reaches the age of maturity, who's, sat, who's sane, who's a male, who's, um, who, all these conditions, and, you, and also the biggest one, you can't change your mushtahid, you know, you have to keep on following the same one. Now, if you show this to an outside person, they automatically, whilst your books might not say this is blind following per se, the outside person will automatically think this is, you're following, you're following blindly. You may label it as imitation or following because you don't have the sources, but to someone who's new to Islam or someone who's new to the doctrine, they won't ever understand this. So I think it's really important for the young Shias as well, not even just Shias, I mean, I'm sure there's, I don't know too much about how it is like in Sunnism, but I don't think it's as much as it is now because, um, you know, I, 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 I think with Shiism, it's very profound. You have Ayatollahs, you mean, you, you, have, you have them who've researched it their whole lives. Um, and I think it's really important to reevaluate, you know, how much Allah has given us uh, inside intelligence and inside intellect we rave on about intellect but then intellect has cut off when it comes to doing taqlid so I, I think it's important to take it from this angle as well that people uh ponder about what they're actually doing and these regurgitated uh issues that they're told to believe in since they're young to question them and to kind of you know places like al isla other places like that are important because they do you know, websites like the Shia Reformists and other websites as well do put the sources out there, sources you never even had any access to before. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think that's, that's also something to, worth considering. Thank you for that, Sister Hiba. Uh, Sayyid Ali Hur, you have the floor. Yeah, I'm actually uh, very grateful to you that you've uh, brought up this uh, topic uh, for discussion. Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Hubullah is a very noteworthy and prominent uh, Shia scholar, highly learned. He's a product of the Hawza al of Qum, and he has taught there for many years. He's uh, one of the most sharpest students of Ayatollah Sayyid Mahmoud al-Hashmi Shahroudi, who 
was himself a very brilliant student of Ayatollah Sidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. And the document that you are discussing tonight, um, it lays out the framework or the roadmap for unity and common understanding between the Muslims when it comes to historical issues. And I think the point that Sister Hiba highlighted uh, is exactly what Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is going for in this document. Um, and I hope the admins will share the link uh, to it uh, in the description so that other people can read and benefit from it. But the very first point uh, that he makes in this document is he asserts the right of every Muslim to do ijtihad in various discussions that fall under the umbrella of the two testimonies, shahadatain. And he says that some of the most pertinent of these discussions are those which concern history. So history is not something you should be doing taqlid in, okay? Taqlid kind of, to a certain extent, informed con consultation of scholars makes sense when it comes to the nitty gritties of fiqh, for example, because in fiqh, you have to follow the prophet. But in history, uh, there is no concept of following the prophet. The prophet did not write any history for us. And in fact, most of the history that the Muslims dispute is after the prophet. So in terms of who you follow and what history you follow, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is telling both Shias and Sunnis that we need to respect the right of ijtihad, not just for the scholars, but even for the lay Muslim. Every lay Muslim should have the right to read history from his own lens and ask critical questions and arrive at conclusions. And uh, because history is not part of deen, unfortunately, extreme sectarian elements within both Shiism and Sunnism have kind of uh, treated history like it's part of deen. So that, for example, even Abu Bakr wa Umar wa Uthman, the, the, the Khulafa, all of these things, these are historical matters. They're not Islamic matters exactly. What you can say Islamic is as much as what the Quran discusses. So the Quran in general praises Muhajireen and Ansar and gives them a certain station or yeah, that you can say Islamic. But what happened after the Quran's revelation stopped? That is just history. It's like, it's like any other history. And so if I have a certain position in history that disagrees with yours, you shouldn't be doing takfir of me over that nor do I have the right to do takfir of you. And not just takfir, but even to regard you as a deviant. Just because you, let's say someone believes that Alexander Hamilton, or let's say Benj Benjamin Franklin was supposed to be the first president of the United States of America, instead of George Washington. If an American holds that historical position, um, it would not be right to expel that person from America or to declare him un-American. It's just history. Okay, and so if someone believes that someone was supposed to be the Khalifa after the, the Prophet or someone else was supposed to be, these are historical issues. They don't have any bearing on deen. You don't make them part of the deen because Allah did not make them part of the deen. So Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is saying that every Muslim should have the freedom to have his own ijtihad. And uh, what Sister Hiba has highlighted is that unfortunately Muslims are not doing ijtihad. They're just doing the blind taqlid. And that's why Shias are following a certain historical narrative without questioning it. The way, for example, we question today, we ask some critical questions. Imam al-Sadiq in public is saying this, in private he's saying that, well, can he be a really an imam of guidance if he's, you know, na'udhu billah, lying about such matters? Uh, so these kinds of critical questions Shias don't ask when they read their version. And Sunnis don't ask critical questions when they read their version. And what Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is saying is that both should have the freedom and the latitude to, to read their history in an intellectually reflective manner and ask these questions. And if after asking these critical questions, they reach an alternative or divergent conclusion, that shouldn't be a problem for us as an ummah because history is not deen. Problem is we have equated history with deen. We've made it one and the same. And that's the reason why you have so much intolerance. That's why you have so much takfir and so much hatred in the ummah. Let's be more chillaxed when it comes to history. Um, from last week's session, I remember uh, Sayyid Ali Haider saying that history is not in the syllabus, so you will not be questioned about history. Um, I just wanted to bring that uh, back in here. Thank you, Sayyid Ali Haider, for that. Um, let me go to the next one. Uh, and this is, okay, so the doctrine of Adalatul Sahaba is confusing me. 
um, there are times it is accepted and there are places where it's completely disregarded. Um, and as discussed in our last session, um, there are verses that clearly accept um, in the Quran, there are verses that clearly accept the doctrine. So where do, where do we draw the line when thinking about how this plays a role in, in uh, kufr? Uh, I mean, when we accept it or not accept it, are we, you know, like, there, are, are we going against uh, the core? Um, do you think there is a scope of agreement um, between the, the communities, between the ummah? Did I clarify myself? Yeah? Said the said Hur, you have your hand up, please. The floor is yours. Right. So uh Adalat al Sahaba is basically the doctrine that all of the Sahaba are just. Yani anyone who met the Holy Prophet in his lifetime, uh, even for a few minutes, is someone who should be regarded as just and as truthful and as reliable when he narrates from the Holy Prophet. This is a Sunni uh, doctrine. And if you look at the document that is under discussion tonight, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah says that there should be, obviously Shias don't accept Adalat al-Sahaba and uh, they have their proofs for it from the Quran and Sunnah. And in fact, even Sunni books give proof against Adalat al-Sahaba, the, the famous Hadith al-Hawd, right? Where the Prophet says that there will be companions who will come to me on the day of judgment and angels will turn them away from me. They will drive them away from me the way camels are driven away. And I will say, these are my ashab, and they will say, you don't know what they did after you. So, yes, in, in, in a sectarian spirit, sometimes what happened in certain periods of history is that Sahaba were given this uh, blank check of sorts, or this uh, absolute immunity uh, from divine prosecution um, and from error and, and deviation. And in fact, some re Sunni reformist scholars have said that um, Shias, in a way, are more consistent when it comes to claiming infallibility for their imams because they claim infallibility in theory and then in practice also they treat their imams as if they are infallible. Whereas in Sunnis, you have this paradox whereby in theory the Sahaba are not infallible, but in practice you are almost treating them as if they are infallible because you are justifying all of their mistakes. Any mistake or any error that they make is justified as an error in ijtihad. So that even if a Sahabi deliberately and willfully goes against a clear command of God in the Quran, that is not viewed as sinful behavior. That's just viewed as a mistake in ijtihad. So Muawiyah, unfortunately, can wage a bloody war against Imam Ali alayhi salam and kill so many Sahaba. And that will somehow be justified as well. That was a mistake in ijtihad. Whereas the reality is anyone who studies the history of Muawiyah will see that it was not ijtihad. It was a willful disregard and defiance of of, of what Islam teaches. So in any case, these are historical matters. What Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is saying is that when a Shia does ijtihad, for example, in the matter of companions, and he arrives at the conclusion that some of the companions made errors, given that the Shia does not accept the principle of Adalat al-Sahaba, let alone their infallibility, then believing in this conclusion does not imply that they have acted, uh, they've committed an act of kufr. Okay, just as uh, Sunnis, Sunnis uh, and their scholars, I won't say awam, but the, the higher level scholars of Ahlul Sunnah and the scholars of the Salaf, they have critiqued Ahlul Bayt. They have critiqued the position of Sayyidah Fatima. Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, is very critical of the position of Sayyidah Fatima in the dispute of Fadak. In fact, he even goes very far and he accuses, he compares her to Na'udhu Billah to the Munafiqeen. And he even goes against the, the, the decorum and the respect that is appropriate. And that's why some other Sunni scholars lashed out against him and they condemned him for it, for, for doing that. He also has some very critical statements against Imam Ali alayhi salam. So if Ahlul Bayt can be critiqued by, you know, Salafi and Sunni scholars, then why are Sahaba now being given a station above Ahlul Bayt, such that even when they manifestly go against the Quran and Sunnah, they cannot be critiqued and they, it cannot be said that they have, what they have done is wrong. So this is what Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is highlighting. And I think uh, learned, enlightened Sunni scholars would not have a problem with that. Sunni scholars who are reformed would say that there is no issue. We do accept that uh, Sahaba made mistakes uh, in ijtihad and some mistakes were even willful and deliberate and they went against uh, the Quran and Sunnah in certain instances, some of the Sahaba, right? We're not saying all of them. And so that, that shouldn't be an issue. They would agree with what Sheikh Haider Habullah is calling us towards. 
So the Kunushia Janna is not true. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to put it there. Sister Roxanne, you have the floor. Um, this is just a small point. Um, I think we sometimes are um, a bit unfair on our Sunni brother and sisters um, because we we don't quite understand why this doctrine formed. There are there are multiple reasons why this doctrine formed. It's not singular at all. But one of the reasons, and one of the reasons why it has been clung to for such a long time is partly due to sectarianism. So when sort of early uh, Hulu Shias were, or Hali Shias were, were cursing uh, revered figures, um, Ahl Sunnah, when it formed, started creating barriers to that cursing, right? So they, they formed this doctrine almost reactionarily against sectarianism within the Ummah. And these, these battle lines hardened over time as the sectarianism increased, right? So we have to sort of give our Sunni brothers and sisters a little bit of empathy and a little bit of understanding as to why this formed. This doesn't mean, this empathy doesn't mean that we are not allowed to have our own historical jihad and voice our criticisms of specific figures in an academic fair way. Um, but it, it, it also requires you to have a little bit of a wider scope if you're gonna if you're gonna sort of critique your own tradition you also have to have a little bit of a wider scope as to how traditions evolved on the other side of things um thank you for that uh Said Raza, you raised your hand uh, you have the floor yes <laughs> muted it yeah i think um what everyone's mentioned is uh, really powerful to add a couple of points you see a lot of this, uh, like Sister Roxanne correctly mentioned, a lot of it's like a sadhariya, it's like closing of the door. Um, what they do is that to avoid kind of um, the attacks on the Sahaba by the kind of extreme Shias, what they done was they ended up basically closing the door completely. That's why you'll notice that amongst the Sunnis, there's been a movement that even defended people like Yazid. Um, that's there's different very reasons for that some could be that they're actually being influ um, uh, influenced by nasabi elements and the other element is that they know yazid's wrong they know muawiyah's wrong but what they do is they close the door so they say listen if we start at yazid they'll never get to abu bakr umar <laughs> so what they do is let's just stop it there i think imam ghazali even mentioned something like this someone who's an imam ghazali imam ghazali is not ibn taymiyyah imam ghazali was Sufi orientated I think he mentions about Yazid where he says that um, you know let's you know don't open that door otherwise it's going to end up on Muawiya and others and a lot of Sunni scholars have said that you know Muawiya is like the curtain if you start at him then they'll go forward so what they've done is they've done kind of closed the doors and I can understand why they're doing it but the problem is is that there was there could have been a time and place why they've done it in the 21st century now information is free like I said you now in the 21st century in a sense, uh, and I say this in a bit of a crude way, everyone's kind of naked. Um, all the sources are out there. Um, the Shia sources, Sunni sources, everything's out there. Hiding stuff in this age, um, covering stuff, it's not going to work. It's going to have an anti-reaction. And people are going to be like, what? And this is why essentially Sunnis are so defensive on these, uh, on these positions, because they just don't know about it. They think, what? Like, how can you be even... Say Forget about, like, Shaykhain or Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha. They can't understand you having a negative opinion on Muawiyah. They're like, what? Like, we never heard this. So their scholars need to also be a bit honest with themselves and start educating their public so they can actually understand this. Okay, these are, your, these are kind of your issues and we understand what your problems are. And that's why they're, 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 the, the Sunni Awam are more understanding of, okay, we kind of get where you come from. Unless they start educating their followers... Um, these complications will continue. So there was a time and place where they done what they done, but I think in today's time, the way we're educating our Shia, and I think Hedr Hubullah kind of stresses upon this in his kind of Risala, which is, you, there's no point of just covering stuff. You need to now discuss these things, be it in your own circles. And Alhamdulillah, there's a reformist Sunni scholars that have done this. Um, that's a different story that they get attacked the way we do <laughs> in their own circles. Because let's be honest, no one likes reform scholars, no matter from what side. Um, 
but someone's got to do it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, like we we're saying, if if we're if we're doing uh, reformism, if we're going to research, if we're going to do our ijtihad, and if we do it in a non-biased, in a very academic way, um, like we do on Isnad, I think the answers that we're going to get are going to be stronger uh, because they're going to be evidence-based. But yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, Sayyid Ali Haider, you have the floor. Yeah, I wanted to point out uh, the difference between popular understanding of religion and history versus the book understanding. And uh, I want to specifically uh, uh, congratulate and uh, um, uh, appreciate Al Islam for uh, bringing out all these sessions because what Al Islam brings out in its isnas and other videos is the the book version of of the events the book version of what's what's happened in history uh, a lot of things that people don't know a, a lot of what people follow is the popular version and uh, you know people really need to think about this that what is popularly recited on the members is something that is in a lot of areas and a lot of instances very different and sometimes completely antithetical to what the accepted book truths are. I'll give you a very simple example, you know, back from the uh, other isna that we had done related to this one, we had a comment that was sent to us that uh, where one person was very passionately uh, lambasting us and saying, how dare you say that Imam Sadiq -Islam, was related to Hazrat Abu Bakr, you know, and, it's, and you look at that and you're like, what's happened, you know, I mean, this person obviously is saying this because he's been fed so many narratives from the member that now he cannot even accept that uh, Imam Sadiq -Islam, has got a blood relation with Hazrat Abu Bakr, which is established fact. So this is what's happening. A lot of what is popularized in the Shia communities is something that has become antithetical or it, it exists as something that's antithetical to the truths because what is the history that's being recited from the member in a lot of instances is very different from what is the book history even in the Shia books you know and until that is corrected you cannot expect any kind of reform to happen so one of the things I think al is doing is trying to rectify that and try to correct that so that people can start thinking properly out of the box Thank you for that, Sayyid Ali Haider. Um, yeah, when, when you open uh, Kitab al Ishad and you start reading it, uh, it could blow your mind. Um, so anybody who hasn't and you have it at home, please do just like randomly open a page and read it. Sister Hiba, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a really brief point. Point. Um, within the spectrum of Sunnis, there's different thoughts and different opinions. Obviously, you have the most extreme uh, opinions and you have the more moderate opinions. But I think that um, it would be, I think we have to consider that the reason why we can pinpoint a lot of things on some Sahaba and we can understand a lot of history is because it is documented in the Sunni books. Um, they've documented it very clearly what mistakes had happened, what, what things what certain Sahabas did, how they were in their life. So they don't really shy away from the fact that Sahabas were prone to making mistakes, major, uh, major or minor. But I think that we understand that, from my understanding at least of the sources, is that I, I don't, I've not seen um, the majority of Sunni scholarship to say that the Sahabas were infallible. They don't have that as part of their um, doctrine or they, they don't have that as part of their theology. They accept that they've made mistakes. Um, but I think as, as the points have made before, um, that this was put up as a barrier to stop people from cursing or thinking extremely badly of the Sahaba. I think, I think if from that lens, um, it's, it's not essentially part of their, part of their deen insofar as infallibility is, is a prerequisite of the Sahaba. And when you compare that to what we have in our community of, you know, the 12 Imams having infallibility and that is part of the theology, um, I think you can see the difference there because if the Sunnis are saying that Adalat al-Sahaba is there insofar as they are reliable transmitters of Hadith because they strove in the way of Islam, 
Islam and the, they were persecuted. Um, they were the f- first foremost runners of faith, uh, the Mahajri and Ansar. If we, if, they, if we take it from that lens, then it doesn't, it, it seems like um, by, call, by saying to them that they call the Sahabas infallible and, you know, from that root, they, they label them as not making any mistakes in their life. I think it's doing injustice to the majority of Sunni beliefs who think that the Sahabas did make mistakes, but it doesn't detract from the fact that majority of them, um, when they were narrating hadiths, they were doing so um, because they obviously had, they had, uh, they had this, they had a very pure kind of love for Islam initially. So I, I think that also needs to be considered. I, I'm not sure if I've explained it too correctly, but uh, or too accurately, but that's my perception of this doctrine and how it's come about and how Sunnis understand it. Um, thank you so much for that, Sister Hiba. Actually, that brings me to my uh, to my third question and connected. So, uh, Sheikh Hadar uh, invites uh, Imami Shia to revisit uh, their understanding of companions of the Prophet by putting aside all remnants of history and sectarian tensions. So, what sort of outcome for such an unbiased and objective study of the Sahaba? would you expect or rather hope for? Say the Hur, you have the floor. Right, as you can see, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is being very balanced. You know, just as he has invited Sunnis to revisit their positions, he's also asking the Shias to do the same. Because the status quo as it is, there is so much hatred and suspicion and division between the Shias and Sunnis. So clearly the way things are right now is not ideal. Both need to move away from rigidity and they need to move away from what they are on currently in order to create a culture of greater harmony and peaceful unity within the Ummah. And so in terms of your question of how that would play out on the Shia side of things, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah actually in that uh, document goes on to point out that the Shia text- textual heritage is full of reports which show that many companions uh, were beyond satisfactory. And in fact, some contemporary Shia scholars have written works on the companions whom the Shia deemed to be righteous and acceptable. And that list uh, goes well beyond, you know, the few c- companions you will find mentioned in Al-Kafi, for example. Uh, that's actually the Ghali narrative that says after the Holy Prophet, all the companions apostated except for, uh, you know, a handful of them, five, six, seven, or, or maximum 10. So that's the Ghali narrative. But even if you go towards the, the moderate Shia position, Uh, you will see that they have a far greater list of companions whom they revere and they they respect. And what Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah does is that he invites the Shias to to do something about this image that is formed in the hearts and minds of the Ummah, whereby Shia are always seen as people who are against Sahaba and they're always, you know, they've become famous for, you know, cursing and abusing Sahaba. I think uh, we've lost uh, Sayed Hor, and I think he should be back. Um, Sayed Raza. Yeah, I'll take over until he comes back. It's no problem. Um, yeah, so but, but, as I said, Ali Hur, I'll just continue exactly in his that Heather Hubullah is inviting the, the Shia to basically revisit their position that they've become position that they've become famous for, and um, they haven't become famous from it just because of Sunni strawmans. They've become famous, so we've got to be um, we've got to be fair and objective. That we are responsible to an extent, to a large extent, ourselves. Um, we do have this narrative that we, whether publicly or privately, do that we can cons- that we consistently um, put a negative image of the companions, and we focus on the mistakes of specific companions rather than giving you a balanced, full view. And naturally, what that does is, in uh, amongst the followers of the Shia, um, and obviously when I say Shia, I'm talking about the Twelvers, we then have like a negative view, apart from literally a handful, because every every time you go to the member, every time you go to the mosque, you go to the member, they're preaching you only a couple of names that are good, and consistently pointing to the mistakes of you know the others. So when you're only hearing mistakes, 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 you can't hear anything good about them because you think, oh, these people must be bad. Instead, if you had studied their lives thoroughly and fairly, 
you would have seen that actually uh, they've done some good things as well. And that's why, like Sayyid Ali um, Haider mentioned, that someone couldn't even understand that what Imam Sadiq's, you know, related to Hajj al He's like, what? How can you say this? Because the brainwashing is so strong. So the Sunnis have their own brainwashing, but this is our brainwashing. And what Haider Habul are saying is, reown your narrative and actually come to a more balanced view so that actually Sunnis don't see you with so much suspicion. Because the reason they're seeing you like that is because a lot of it's to do with your own behavior. I'm not saying all of it's necessarily true, but a lot of it, we kind of do a lot of own goals, kind of reclaim your narrative and start seeing that actually a lot of these companions sacrificed for the religion. Um, and I think a good understanding of that would be if you were to read the books of Sirah, of the Prophet, the biography. You know, this is I think something that um, we lack on. I think at the moment, um, I think there's a, an educated Shi'i scholar uh, by the name of Sayyid Ali Imran I think he's uh, based on a website called Al Iqra Online He's doing a lot of serial work on the Prophet um, I think you'll find his videos on his YouTube channel They're doing really good work Because once you go through the Sirah You start to appreciate the companions a lot more You're like, wow, these companions sacrificed a lot And it's not just the companions that you hear about It's loads of other ones Including the not so popular ones Including Abu Bakr, Umar You're like, wow, what? they done these things That means they weren't all bad Right, <laughs> what we were told. So yeah, you know, uh, say that um, say that Ali Hur is back. I just I was just uh, filling in. Say that Ali Hur, take it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you made a you made a great point, uh, mashallah, and uh, I agree with you uh, in terms of you know she has not devoting enough attention to, to Sahaba, for example, or uh, focusing, even when they come to Sahaba, <laughs> you'll hear more lectures and speeches about Sahaba who are actually Shia of Imam Ali and his supporters of Imam Ali salam, in his battles. But there are actually also Sahaba who died in the time of the Holy Prophet, whom you don't get to hear enough about. Mus'ab ibn Umair is such a brilliant example. He's a Sahabi whom Imam Ali salam, used to admire so much. He was this really beautiful, brilliant, youthful figure. I would urge and encourage all of our youths to read his biography, Mus'ab bin Umair, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi. So inspiring the sacrifices that he gave for Islam. He was the Prophet's first ambassador to the city of Medina. He established Islam over there and he was a very youthful figure and he got martyred in the Battle of Uhud. And there are so many other such distinguished companions uh, whom we don't hear enough about. Um, because first of all, there isn't enough focus on the Sahaba. Um, kind of, you know, it's like we have this idea that because the sect is called Shia al Imamiyah, it is Imamocentric. So, on the one hand, there is there are complaints that Allah is not mentioned enough, and on the other hand, when it comes to historical personalities, you don't want to move beyond the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And no doubt, Imams of Ahlul Bayt are the paragons of virtue and some of the best role models you'll ever have. But apart from them. There are also other great examples that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt themselves asked us to reflect uh, on. And so basically the outcome would be a greater degree of tolerance, a greater degree of, you know, of, of manners and, and, and respect within, within the Ummah. And uh, yeah, basically uh, critiquing, but doing so very respectfully and academically, not, uh, not the kind of, you know, ritualized cursing or... Uh, using abusive language that you see in certain dark sections of our communities. Thank you for that, Sayyid Uh Sayyid Raza, you have the floor again. Yeah, you, you know, Brother Smith, ignore that request because I, I know what your next question, hopefully you'll, I'll connect it there. So yeah, go and keep there. <laughs> ignore me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Sister Rafsana, you have the floor. Um, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to bring up a verse that I think is quite relevant to this discussion. It's actually a really beautiful du'a um, in Surah 59. It's from the, the people who, um, who embraced Islam after the Prophet and his followers had emigrated uh, from Mecca, um, in contrast to the helpers who embraced Islam before the immigration. And uh, it's in Surah 59, it's ayah number 10, and it says, and those who came after them say, our Lord forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith, and place no rancor in our hearts to the words of those who believe our Lord truly thou art kind and merciful. Um, and it's a prayer that, that indicates a desire that there be no discord between them and those who preceded them in religion, 
Um, and, but it also, obviously, it's it's particular to that historical situation, but it also can be understood to impart an attitude that all Muslims should have toward one another. And it can also be read as a reference to everyone who enters Islam until the day of resurrection in, in terms of their attitude towards those who preceded them. And I really wish that when Shias and Sunnis, both groups, decide to do their own personal re historical research, do their own ijtihad, that they make this dua before they begin that process. Because I think that that would really help put you in the right mindset. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, 5910, we should, uh, we should have that uh, on the screen when uh, we're discussing this. Um, Sayyid Ali Haider, you have your hand up. Yes, um, so regarding the matter of how the imamis should uh, view the companions and revisit the understanding of the companions of the prophet, uh, I think the very first thing that we need to look at and to introspect and to critically think about is sincerity, ikhlas. Because if you don't have ikhlas, you can't get anywhere. And, you know, we recite this ever so often, surah ikhlas, you know, and it's, it's, it's about the sincerity of it. And you can't reach truth without having sincerity. So I'll give you a small example to demonstrate that. Look at the example of hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu And uh, whenever this is talked about in Shia circles and in Majalis, it, the very pertinent point is highlighted how Imam Ali Islam sacrificed by sleeping in the bed of the Prophet. And the Quraysh would think that uh, the Prophet is there and you know, then they would attempt to kill him he would be the sacrifice. And that's very important uh, to keep in to mind. But while they're doing that, they are completely ignoring the other half of the story. And the other half of the story is that Hazrat Abu Bakr is the one who helped the Prophet plan the hijrah, uh, plan the routes, hire the guide, be with him step by step. His daughter helped out in hiding them initially. And a lot of these things are not even known to the Shia masses because uh, they're never mentioned. You know, and then they were together in the cave where the Quran uh, actually honors Hazrat Abu Bakr by saying, uh, by calling him Thaniyat Nain, that he's the second of the two. You know, we're the Prophet وسلم, and Hazrat Abu Bakr, we appeared as two people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that he's the second of the two that are together and honoring his position in the Hijrah. And he was uh, with the Prophet throughout that very dangerous journey where both of them could have been killed at, uh, you know, a number of instances. So this example was to demonstrate that, and you see this in so many places, that's just one example. You see in so many places where the position of the companions, their sacrifices are completely ignored, um, completely put aside, completely unknown as well. I mean, you ask yourself, who are the people who are taking Islam far and wide? Who are the emissaries, to the prof uh, emissaries of the prophet to other kings and other heads of state, they were the Sahaba. Who were the people who were uh, taking the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala far and wide in different places, in Kufa, in Basra, in Sham, in other places before any of the Ahlul Bayt had ever stepped there, way before any of the Ahlul Bayt had ever stepped into any of these areas, they were the Sahaba, right? So to me, the Sahaba and the Ahlul Bayt are the two legs upon which the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ stands. And if you take any one of these legs out, you're, you'll become one legged. So, you know, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Thank you for that. Um, continuing from there, I want to ask, um, I mean, I want to go back to the, to, to the document. And it's really admirable how the Sheikh does not shy away from tackling a matter that has unfortunately served as a flashpoint for conflict and unrest in the Ummah too often. Um, and that is the practice of cursing some of the revered icons of the Ummah, especially among the Sahaba. Uh, and I would like to uh, read uh, directly from what he's written. Uh, he says, we reject the apparent phenomena of cursing, swearing, and slandering the revered figures of other Muslims, like some of the companions and mothers of the believers. In addition, we reject all other disgraceful behavior that is committed in the same vein, like the events that take place on 9th Rabil Awal in some minority imami communities. 
So the learned Sheikh does not mince his words and has made it abundantly clear his outlook with this statement. How can this be translated into reality at the practical level we are at? Sayyid Ali Haider, you have the floor. Yeah, that is a very good question. That's a very beautiful question, Brother Samir. How do you translate it into reality? And it kind of goes back to the episode we had on the movie, The Lady of Heaven. I think it was Sayyid Reza who had mentioned that, you know, uh, there were all these uh, scholars and speakers who in the Fatimiyas, they're doing all the cursing and all the regurgitating of the story. And then they're coming out uh, against the movie and saying, no, this should not be shown and this is wrong. That's like, that's, there's a hypocrisy there, right? So I'm, I'm gonna piggyback off uh, uh, that same line of thought that, okay, so how can we make this prominent in the communities? So those same communities and their leaderships sometimes are going to say that, you know, al Khamenei has a fatwa against cursings and all this, so it should not happen. And they will uh, give lip service to that. Or they might give lip service to what uh, Agha Sistani has said, that uh, the Sunnis are not only our brothers, they are our souls. And, uh, and, and, and let me point out something there as well. There's... there's uh, let me not put an, a, a word to it, but let me just say it out. Even at that point, I'll take a little excursion. So Agha Sistani on one hand will say that the Sunnis are not just our brothers, they are our souls. But then at the same time, he's going to say that if you give zakat to them, it's batil, right? And he's going to say that if you pray behind them, it's batil. You have to pray again and you can't even give zakat to their poor. So then you're like, okay, so how are they are not just our brothers, they are our souls, but we cannot even give our zakat them? Side issue. I'll leave people to ponder upon that themselves. But let's come back to the communities. So on one hand, there's lip service. On the other hand, how many community presidents and community chairmen are ready to establish in their communities and make a rule that no alim and no zakir is going to use the member to do the cursing. And let me add this on, not just explicit cursing, but implicit cursing, right? We know how it goes that, oh yeah, on the, we are not gonna say a curse on, you know, uh, this Sahaba, that Sahaba, but we're gonna say, um, we're gonna say that uh, a curse on the first, the second and the third. Everyone knows what that means, right? And then they're gonna say, well, in Ziyarat Ashura, and we're, go we're gonna just say a curse on the first, second and third. What does that mean? Everyone knows what that is, right? So what, what are you trying to do? You're trying to be double-faced, say that, no, we're not doing it, but we're actually doing it without showing that we're doing it. So let's just be straight about it and, if we are sincere about this, let the community heads, the jamaats, the, uh, the uh, uh, executive boards, president, chairmen, make a rule, make a very standardized rule. There'll be no explicit or implicit cursing because not only is it anti-Islamic, it's, it's pretty much not even you know, dignified as a human thing. It's a very undignified and a very street-like thing, you know, to do those kind of things. Thank you for that. Um, can I uh, can I implore you to further look into these kind of discrepancies, and then we have an isnat about those, inshallah. Let's see. Yeah, that's a good uh, idea. Yeah. Uh, Says Raza Rizvi, you have the floor. Yeah, mashallah, Sayyid Ali Heather hit some really good points there, and um, definitely that 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 deserves a future program on that. Um, you know, on this issue, because uh, Asher Khader Hubullah has basically said some amazing things, I don't feel like I'll be doing service by explaining it. Rather, I'm just going to read some of it because it's so powerful, some of this stuff, um, if you permit me. Uh, okay. Yes, so check, check this out. He basically says that, just give me one second. So on the cursing of the revered figures, he says, listen, he says, Although the famous and popular position of the Shia scholars is that it is not obligatory to curse the companions. And in fact, they do not allow the cursing when it can result in harm. Look, listen, when it can result in harm um, for the Shia themselves. But the fact of the matter is, and I will be very blunt and clear on this, that the general imami atmosphere, look, this is very important, the general imami atmosphere and people that are on this panel and the people, the Shias that are listening, they know this. Because Sunnis don't know this stuff. They don't live in our community. We know it. Is that the general imami atmosphere is such that they do not prohibit nor see any problem with cursing some of the companions. 
In fact, cursing some of the companions is a habitual practice amongst a few of the Shia and is a practice that has intensified in recent times despite internal disputes and debates on this matter amongst the Shia. So now what he does is, he carries on a little bit. Um, our message is the one that rejects this practice and we do not consider it to be a desirable practice as far as a healthy religious culture is concerned. Now he invites the Shia Imamiya Marjaiya. We invite the Shia Imamiya Marjaiya to maintain a clear position against this malicious practice which has gone out of control. We believe that slandering the revered, the revered figures of other Muslims and harming their sentiments is not a justified practice. Will any imami accept and tolerate the cursing of any of the al bayt So he look, he does jawab, he's, he, he, he flips it. He says, if there was the other way around, would you, would you permit that? Would you accept that? If any person were to do such a thing, the Shia themselves will consider them to be disbelievers and give the religious verdict of execution for blasphemy against the Al-Bayt. So he says, if that was the other way around, you would be seeing their kuffar and basically kill them. So why do we not respect the sentiments of the rest of the Muslims today by not slandering their respected figures, just as we expect and demand respect for our revered figures? As in, what more do I have to say to that? As in, what tafsil can I... It's self-explanatory. Me saying anything will, ru will ruin that anyway. So I think it's clear that what, what he's saying is, is that, listen, you need to take a clear stance and the culture of the marjaiya on this issue is not a clear one. And they're kind of blurring the lines as Sayyid Ali Haider alluded to as well. You need to take a clear stance on this issue and not kind of play both sides. As we know that scholars of all sects, including ours, are known to do. You can't have your cake and eat it. Take a clear stance and stop playing a double game on the issue. Thank you for that, Sayyid Reza. Uh, Sayyid Ali Hur, I'll give you the floor, but let me give Sister Rosana the floor first. This, this is something, obviously, that we, we touched on uh, in the last Isnad uh, about uh, the Lady of Heaven film. But I think it's an important point just to reiterate that we now live in the age of social media. Mm -hmm. And the age of social media it can create, can heighten the toxicity of this sectarianism particularly around the use of implicit cursing. So we now have people who share specific symbols or images um, uh, on social media that imply cursing of the Sahaba. We think, or she is somehow think that they're speaking some sort of special secret coded language that no one else can understand. Sunnis also live within this social media paradigm. They're fully aware of what these symbols mean. So. The idea that you're sort of wink, wink, doing something that no one else has copped to isn't, isn't, isn't happening. What you're doing is, is very, it's not clear. It's clear, open cursing of revered figures. And sadly, I've not only witnessed, you know, the Shia laity en engaging in this. I've seen people who speak on the member engaging in this online. Now, this is, this is a difficult age for the Maharaja to navigate. Uh, it's not issues that they've dealt with before. Um, and so it is even more important in an age where this stuff can spread almost like a social virus, that it, there should be very clear, very explicit statements condemning this behavior. Not ambiguous, no equivocalness about any of this. There should be statements that say that if you do this, you are going against the ulama. Mm. You are going against your revered scholars. Any equivocation will be, will be manipulated and used to continue the practice. Thank you for that, uh, Sr. Rafsana. Uh, say the Hur. Right. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I can imagine many of our viewers will be saying, when you're talking about the issue of la'na and cursing and abusing and all of that, isn't la'na there in the Quran? And we're not talking about the Quranic la'na, which uh, is invoked uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the kathibin, against the zalimin, uh, these different categories of people, um, against who reject the truth after it has come to them, all of that. Um, we're talking about ritualized cursing. Okay, even the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they invoke the La'ana of Allah upon the Ghulat as a means of disassociating from them. But what has happened in our communities is this, what, what you call ritualized La'ana, and Ayatollah Shaykh Haider Qabullah in that document that we are discussing tonight, he actually expl explicitly traces 
the origins of this practice back to the Umayyad dynasty. It was Muawiyah who started this ritualized cursing of Imam Ali salam, on the member. He made it part of the Friday sermon. So he made it part of religious practice, which is what the Ghulat later on did. They did the opposite of it, which is uh, they didn't add it to Salatul Jum'ah, but they took other things like ziyara and supplications that you recite after prayer, and they inserted lana of the revered figures of, of Muslims with whom they had differences into those supplications. So that cursing and invoking lana upon certain personalities became part of the liturgy. And so Sheikh Haider Habullah very um, uh, appropriately asks this question to the Shia. He says, was it not the Umayyad dynasty that initiated the practice of swearing, slandering, and cursing in Islamic history? as per the belief of many by cursing Ali and his progeny on the pulpits. So is it not necessary for the opponents of the Bani Umayyah? And if you are a Shia and you're opponents of Bani Umayyah, why are you imitating them? Okay, rather as the opponents of Bani Umayyah, you should be far lofty in practice than them. And you should insist on maintaining an ethical demeanor while being critical of history and highlighting the shortcomings that uh, occurred and uh, if you can just enable me to uh, to share the screen i shared this the last time i can share it again uh, what sheikh haider habullah is talking about is right in front of you here i gave you an example this is uh, this is the book fadak fi tarikh by ayatollah sayyid shaheed muhammad baqir sad uh, this is a rare edition it was uh, gifted by him this is his handwriting to the library of the american university in beirut and you can see throughout this book, he talks about the Sahaba, particularly the Khulafa, Abu Bakr and Umar. And wherever he mentions their name, you will see he mentions Az Zahra, Salawatullahi Alayha, Wal Khalifa Al Awwal, Radiyallahu Ta'ala Anhu. He has no problem saying Radiyallahu Ta'ala Anhu for the first Khalifa. So he shows the respect. But at the same time, he's also critical. He does not mince words when it comes to criticizing their, their, their stances. So uh basically what what, what Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habullah is saying is that we should not follow the way of the Banu Umayyah, we should follow the way of the Ahlul Bayt and also the contemporary, some of the leading contemporary Shia scholars have shown us the way forward in terms of how to deal with these kinds of things. That's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a very simple uh, lesson to take home. Uh Sayyid Raza, you have the floor. Uh Brother Smith, I was I literally gonna say that you heard took my point <laughs> i was literally gonna just mention the point about banu Umayyah that this is a sunnah of muawiyah and his descendants and the banu Umayyah. um for those that say call themselves shia this is the problem that you can be you say we're followers of imam ali but then we do the practices of muawiyah and his followers so let's leave the practices of muawiyah and his followers to them because the sunnis have left it mm. the sunnis are not cursing ali <laughs> so the sunnis are even disagree with muawiyah <laughs> We disagree with Muawiyah, so why are we following Muawiyah and Banu Umayyah's way? Let's leave them. The Sunnis have left them. Let's leave them as well. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Zed Raza. Uh, Sister Hiba, you have the floor. I just wanted to quickly add um, that in the in the document by um, Sheikh Hobalab, when he he has some really good gems there. So, for example, when um, Brother Raza was quoting that there's a general imami atmosphere. Um, of cursing and you know there's also the, the atmosphere that um, not to hurt you should you should try not to hurt your uh, fellow Sunni brothers or your the other fellow Ummah um, I just wanted to point out that there is a lot of there's a lot of people in the community who accept this who don't want to hurt uh, the Sunni brothers they won't curse publicly but behind closed doors privately they will not have a gathering that does not mention the cursing of the first two caliphs. Um, so they, they will literally just say whatever they want privately because they understand that we can't do it publicly because it will hurt their sentiments and feelings. And I think this goes back to the first point that was made initially in this Isnad session about the two-facedness and the crookedness of certain people and the way that, you know, we've accepted this whole taqiyya is part of the religion. It's inherently part of it. 
it becomes a tit for tat thing because if you quote to them the Quranic ayahs that say do not insult, do not call others by nicknames, uh, do not pardon each other, uh, be respectful to each other. The Prophet as the prime uh, rahmat alameen, he was the mercy upon mankind, he was amazing in akhlaq. You can quote all these all you want, but the reply privately will be, well, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar abused the family of the Prophet. They killed Sayyidah Zahra. They did this, they did that. And you expect us to respect them. And I think it would it will literally always be a tit for tat, a ping pong issue because you can quote as many Quranic eyes as you want to tell them not to, to to perfect their speech and to be good in your speech, even in private gatherings. Because if you say things routinely, if you become a habitually uh, inclined to cursing someone, it becomes part of your character. You can say this all you want. They'll reply back with uh, theological uh, history and political myth mishmash skewedness of everything in one as part of the theology. And I think the only the only way to resolve this matter is for you know people to accept the virtues of the Sahaba. Yeah, they made mistakes in so many occasions, and we get that. But I think the only way to resolve this issue is to understand that they did some really good things as well for the preservation of Islam. Islam wouldn't be where it is today. You know, we wouldn't have Muslim countries if it wasn't for Hazrat Umar. That that's a fact that just needs to be accepted. But unless we can come to a balanced opinion, this will just never end. Very true indeed. Um, I mean, I think we've been uh, we've been made to be blind about such uh, interesting and uh, nice things about them, and we've been only shown one side of it. And we need to change that narrative uh, for ourselves. And I think that's what we are doing here at Alice Line on and uh, it's not. Sayed Amir, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, as was quickly mentioned, that the only religion in the world that have ritual cursing, except Shiism, is Judaism. They have a tradition of ritually cursing Jesus and other people that they claim to be false prophets. You know, so you don't see in the seat of the prophet, the prophet walking around and cursing, uh, you know, Abu Sufyan or Mushrikeen. You know, in fact, the Quran tells us not to curse the idols. You know, of the Mushrikeen because they will curse Allah. Uh, out of ignorance, so we shouldn't go around cursing people. So it, this can't be something that is Islamic founded because we can't find it in the Quran, we can't find it in the Sunnah of the Prophet. But what we can find it is with the Jews, you know. Yeah, in the Talmud, they have detailed, uh, just that we have detailed prayers, they have detailed curses on how to curse Jesus, on how to curse different uh, groups, different people. And, and you know, if you look at Kitab al Shia by the 12 verse Shia scholar Nabi Bakhti, it mentions that. The one that started the Sunnah was Abdullah ibn Saba, that used to be a Jewish rabbi. So it's possible that, uh, or in fact, I believe that it started with him, he, that he used to curse Isa, and when he became Muslim, he just took this tradition of cursing Jesus and applied it on the Khulafa, the Khulafa Rashidun. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting history. But it's good to know that maybe the Gulats could have been, uh, I don't know, maybe from that community? Yeah, they were probably differently inspired by these people. Because if you look, at where did the Gulats appear? They didn't appear in Medina. You didn't find them in Mecca. You didn't find, you know, when uh, the Prophet died, three cities uh, stayed Muslim, right? Everyone else apostated. Taif, Mecca, and Medina. These three cities. Everyone else apostated. And we don't find these groups in Med Mecca, Medina, or Taif. We find them in obscure places, you know. We find them, for example, uh, where the Christians of the Middle East used to live, of the Arabian Peninsula. We find them where the Majus used to live. We find them in the far, uh, the distant places of the Islamic world. We don't find them in Mecca and Medina. So, uh, you know, it, it, when, you, when, uh, when you read about them, it's obvious that these people were new converts, probably trying to get some political uh, position because in the end of the day, uh, religion back then was a business, you know? These people used to earn a living by holding sermons and holding khutbahs and gathering people around them. It's even today, you know, people are uh, earning big money in these Husseiniyats, in these uh, Majalis, you know? Afraid of speaking the truth because then they will lose the audience, they will lose their paycheck. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, 
miscommunication, discommunication is not something new, but has been going on for over 2,000 years, it seems. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, we even have uh, instances of propaganda and stuff like that, which were made to push the other side to become a little bit more prominent. So maybe they were actually getting paid to do this. Um, this is again, you know, my Definitely. Opinion. Just as if we had Ben Umayyah propagandist saying that these people were chosen by Allah, the Shia come said, okay, you guys are chosen, but we are guided by Allah. Our Ahlul are guided, you know, just to be above the, <laughs> the Umayyads. Yeah. And we can see, you know, during the Safavids, how they just pushed out books and hadith and narrations to fit the, their messianic agenda, you know. Or the Qulati agenda, because these people were heavy Qulat, you know, may, much of the uh, modern Qulat are inspired by the Safavids. That used to be, uh, you know, not drunk, but they used to be uh, the most Qulat of the Qulats of Sufis, Ali, Ali Allahis, we call them today, Ali worshippers. Mm. Yeah. So, of course, there, there was an agenda behind this, you know. Well, it's uh, it's good to to get a different perspective, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, Sayyid Ali Haider, you have the floor. Yeah, I wanted to make uh, two small points, and one of them is directly related to what uh, Sayyid Amir was saying. Jazakallah Khair and Sayyid Amir for the points you pointed out, um, just as you talked about the Ali Lahis and others. Um, and I think I'd mentioned in the previous Esnad about uh, the book by Professor Matti Musa, where he talked about the extreme Bulat. And uh, the Ali Eli is one of the people he mentioned in there as well. And you, if you go back to Safa with Iran and going into what uh, Sayyid Ali Hurkawa and Puyan Sayyid Reza mentioned about uh, the uh, tradition established by Muawiyah, the Sunnah of Muawiyah, which was uh, cursing, uh, cursing of esteemed personalities, in this case Imam Ali Ali Islam, that he established. And then you see that the uh, Safa with uh, Iran actually promoted that and established that, uh, uh, that sunnah for the cursing of esteemed personalities to the degree. And these are some of those things that uh, the average Shia is not exposed to. And so we, we let them know here so that they're known that uh, when Safavid Iran was first established, there was a, um, a mandatory uh, order that, uh, I don't remember if it was after the Adhan or it was in the Juma prayers. It might have, I think it was the Juma prayers where it was uh, said that it's going to be mandatory to curse the three Sahabas. I mean, the, the three first three Khulafa, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, and Hazrat Uthman. And one of the reasons that was done was to uh, put down all the Sunni ulama that existed in Safavid Iran and to either, and you know, the history is witnessed that they were either uh, executed or they were expelled. And this was one of the, the ways to ensure that there wouldn't be a single uh, Sunni alim who could lead the Salatul Jum'ah uh, in Safavid Iran, because in order to do that, they had to curse the, uh, the first three Khulafa. So uh, that's just to add on to whatever was said about that Sunnah of Muawiyah, the way it was enshrined. And then from that, it spread uh, to today's time, which uh, brings me into my second point, which is, uh, and uh, different people have touched on, on to it. So uh, I want to kind of just put the icing on the cake there. And that is that uh, the onus is on the Maraje and the head scholars and the leaders of the communities to stop this practice. And I'm sure that a lot of people, the question that's going to be boggling them at this point is that uh, why are they not doing this? Why hasn't it happened up till now? Isn't it high time that it should have happened? It should have happened a long time ago. Why are we still talking about that? And I wanted to fill in the answer to that. The answer to that, and it's actually quite elementary and quite unfortunate at the same time, is because they do not have, unfortunately, that, uh, that strong will and courage to stand up against the extremist elements of the community. Our community today has got a lot of extremist elements. And we are at a point, at a fork, where honestly the leadership, whether it be the political leadership of the Jamaats or it be the religious leadership of the Maraji and the high scholars, need to make a decision that are we going to try to accommodate everyone or are we going to take a hard stance that we are not going to accommodate the extremists? And unfortunately, up till today, they're playing the double game where they want to accommodate the extremists. 
they do not want to, um, you know, they do not want to repel the extremists and they do not want the extremists to feel that they're not welcome. They want to maintain this aura where they want to include everyone. It doesn't matter how extreme you are and how negative you are and how much negativity you're causing with the uh, cursings and these kind of things. You know, they want to accommodate them. And, uh, and that is a problem because if you are going to accommodate them, then you're going to lose the moral high ground. And so the onus is on them now that are you ready to continuously keep eroding that high ground for the people of knowledge, they already know that you have lost the moral high ground. But like how Sister Roxana mentioned, it's a world of social media. More and more people are going to understand, are going to recognize that you do not have the moral high ground because you're trying to accommodate all the extremists and you are, uh, your, your, your feet are failing to move forward because you cannot say something that will antagonize them or that will repel them. And so the question stays here that, you know, and what lengths are you ready to go to accommodate the extremists in the communities? And if, uh, and this is, a, this is a kind of a warning in a sense, if you may, that, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying a warning as in I'm giving a warning, but a, a good advice, a nasiha, a good warning advice that, look, if you will continue down this path of accommodating them, it is going to have consequences. These actions are not without consequences. Those consequences might lead to the ostracization of the Shia community at a global level. They might lead to tensions and uh, they might need, lead to uh, clashes between communities. Those clashes might lead to violence. That violence might lead to deaths. You know, there might be uh, cases where these kind of uh, differences might lead to the promotion of terrorism because now terrorists have uh, more ammunition, you know, uh, to, to blame and excuses to attack the Shia communities. So these actions of indecision have consequences. And the moral high ground is that take a stance against extremism. Don't fudge it. Thank you for that, Sayyid Ali Haider. Um, let me continue um, to... My last two questions, but I really need you guys to keep your answers short and to the point now because we've really crossed an hour and a half in this session. So let me go to question number five, where I, towards the end the, uh, in, in, in the document, the Sheikh writes, um, ending on this point, we also want to point the attention of both groups, the Sunni and the Imamiya, towards the remembrance of Imam Zaid, uh, Ibn Ali Al Hussein bin Abi, uh, Abi Talib, and his feats, piety, and religiosity, as he is also one of the symbols of the Ahlul Bayt who are respected by all Muslims today, as far as we know. So do our panelists think that the remembrance of Imam Zaid ibn Ali uh, and reviving his teachings together with those of the other Imams of the Ahlul Bayt can facilitate greater understanding unity within the Muslim Ummah? Said Raza, can I give you this one? Yeah, uh, so it's um, towards the end of his uh, paper, he mentions this uh, point about Imam Zaid bin Ali, alayhi islam, and um, it's, a, it's a very important point. And I think um, the ishara is enough for the people of intellect, as they say. I think the reason he's done this is Imam Zaid's stance in history is quite famous, uh, specifically al Khasusan for the narrative and historical reading of what happened with him when he was martyred. Um, I think what I'll do is, Sayyid Ali Hur, if you can read the narration, Sayyid Ali Hur, if you've got it, and then maybe I can comment on it, Sayyid Ali Hur. Yeah, sure. Um, basically, the, the narrative goes like this. This is Kitab al Futuh. It's also mentioned in Tariq al Tabari, and there are other sources uh, for it as well. Um, the people come to him who have given bay'ah to him. Imam Zaid wanted to bring a revolution against the Banu Umayyah. And so people gave him bay'ah, just like they gave to Imam Hussain before him, his grandfather. People of Kufa gave him bay'ah. Then they come to him and they say, inna qad wa inna nahnu kharijuna ma'ak. They say, we've given you bay'ah and we're prepared to, to move out together with you. But before we do that, ولكن ما تقول في هذين الرجلين الظالمين أبي بكر وعمر. What do you say about these two people, these two oppressors, 
Abu, Abu Bakr and Umar. So you can see this opinion, it exists in the, among the people of Kufa. Uh, there are people in Kufa who regard Abu Bakr and Umar as Zalimin. And these are Shia, by the way. But whether they are moderate Shia or extreme Shia will be judged by comparing their position against the Ahlul Bayt. And Imam Zaid bin Ali is the son of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Zinul Abidin alayhi salam. He's a star of the Ahlul Bayt. And look at what he says. He says, Mahlan. He says, Whoa, stop there. Stop, stop. La taqulu fihima illa khaira. Do not say anything about them except good. Fa inni la aqulu fihima illa khaira. Because I do not say anything about them except good. Notice how this is confirmed. It is corresponding to what Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam is teaching that woman in public. The Ahlul Bayt are united, as you can see. It is the sectarian elements who tried to create confusion and division by saying, no, Ahlul Bayt were teaching something in public and the opposite in private. In any case, Imam Zaid says, I don't say anything about them except good. But this is the Shia, the 12 er Shia may dismiss this by saying, well, this is just the opinion of Imam Zaid, right? Uh, and Imam Zaid is not exactly, we respect him, we revere him, we love him, but he's not hujja on us. He's not our, the hujja of God on earth, as they would say. But he, look at what here, testimony. Wala sami'tu min abai ahadan. He says, it's not just about me. It's about my pious forefathers as well. Now he's talking about Imam Zainul Abidin, Imam al Hussein ibn Ali, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are his pious ancestors and his forefathers. He says, Wala sami'tu min abai ahadan yaqulu fihima illa khaira. I have never heard from any of my forefathers anyone saying about these personalities anything except good. So do you see? It's not just his opinion, it is the opinion of his pious forefathers. And so that's when the, the people, these are obviously extremists, they are disappointed and they try to corner him by saying, Fatara anna bani umayyata ma zalamuk. He said, look, if you're going to say that these Abu Bakr and Umar are not zalim, then Banu Umayyah are also, also not zalim. You see this extremism equating Abu Bakr and Umar to Bani Umayyah and saying, well, if, if Abu Bakr and Umar are not zalim, then what is the point of this revolution? You see, what is the point? You might as well befriend the Banu Umayyah then. And the Banu Abbas and whoever, well, Banu Abbas didn't exist, but I'm, I'm just saying from a uh, contemporary 12 hour perspective, that's how many Shia today also think that there is no difference between the Banu Umayyah and the Banu Abbas and the Khulafa Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. So Zaid bin Ali says, al -qiyasu fi bisawa. This Qiyas of yours is completely flawed. Inna Bani Jaddi al -Husayn. Where are you bringing Banu Umayyah? Banu Umayyah killed my grandfather, Al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. Their crimes are manifest. Okay, they have the blood of the grandson of the Prophet and the flower of Rasulullah on their hands. They carried his head to Damascus. And their zulm is not just confined to the Ahlul Bayt, the Banu Umayyah, they killed the people of Medina in Waqi'atul Harra. They made the city of Medina halal and they shed blood and they looted and plundered the city of the Prophet for three days. As if that was not enough, they added insult to injury. They catapulted the house of Allah, the sacred house of Allah with stones, with filth and fire. Abu Bakr and Umar you are comparing these Banu Umayyah to Abu Bakr and Umar. When did Abu Bakr and Umar do any such thing? Now, here is the point where if the common traditional narrative were correct, the Shia of Kufa could have responded to him by saying that what's the difference? There is no difference. Banu Umayyah killed your grandfather, right? Al Hussein. And uh, Abu Bakr and Umar killed your grandmother. Because that's, that's the claim of the, the Ghulat, yeah? And, and, and of many of those who are influenced by the Ghulat that Abu Bakr and Umar killed Sayyidah Zahra sallallahu alayhi So the rea but the Kufa of that time, these are very early Shia. By this time, this narrative that Abu Bakr and Umar killed Sayyidah Zahra was not even existing. And that's why they could not come back. You see, if Imam Zaid said this to a Shia today, that Banu Umayyah and the Khulafa are not the same. That today's Shia would immediately respond by saying, what do you mean they're not the same? One of them killed your grandfather, one of them killed the grandmother. They are one and the same. In fact, the one who killed your grandmother, because mm -hmm. your grandmother was a lady, those are even worse. 
but they cannot say that because this narrative does not does not exist it's a fab it's a later fabrication that's why they're not able to use it against imam zaid but it, and, and imam zaid himself would not be able to argue in this manner if he was aware of any such narrative if imam zaid knew that abu bakr and umar had killed sayyida zahra there is no way he would say he would try to defend them by saying well the Banu Umayyah killed my grandfather Al Hussein, but Abu Bakr and Umar lam yaf alam in dalika shayya. They did no such thing. He would know as a sane person, he would know that you can't make this argument. For if they have killed your grandmother, then obviously they're no different from the people who killed your grandfather, right? But Imam Zaid knows of no such narrative. This is a later fabrication of the Ghulat that Sayyidah Zahra was killed by them. What the early sources do mention is that a threat was made. But the Ghulat went ahead and turned this threat into an actual event. And we know that the, 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 the only source that, that uh, brings us this narrative is Kitab of Sulaiman bin Qais, which the highest Shia authority of Ilm al-Rijal in his time, Ibn al-Ghadairi, confirmed is a, is a book that has been distorted by fabrications of the Ghulat. Thank you for that, Sayyid Ali um, yes, uh, Rizvi, do you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. Th that the, then that narration, even though because Sayyid Ali was main point, he's done to add after that narration. That's when Imam Zaid then calls them, "You rejected me," and he says, "You are then Rafidis. You rejected me." That's where that term Rafidis come, and that's why generally Sunni like Sunnis they refer to those that curse Abu Bakr Umar as Rafidis. So that's just, just the history behind that term. So. It's a bit. It's ironic that the person who started, the person who first used that term against the Shia, was Imam Zaid himself. Obviously, he meant it like because you rejected me. But Sunnis then used it for rejecting Shaykhain, etc. But the point here is that when Imam Zaid um, comes from Medina to Kufa, this links to Sayyid Ali Hur's point about Al Sahib Al Taq, that narration where he discussed where he comes to Kufa and he says, "Aren't you going to help me?" And Sahib Al Taq says, "Well, you know, there's you're not the Imam chosen by God." And Imam Zaid is like, what are you talking about, Imam chosen by God? So you can see in Kufa, there's a couple of theologies that are being built. Um, the, 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 the theologies that are being built is, you know, first of all, you're not the Imam chosen by God. You're, you know, Imam Zaid is like, what are you talking about? Uh, my father used to feed me food. What Imam chosen by God are you talking about? He never told me about this. Number one. Number two, when he's coming to Kufa, they're like, you know, Zalim Abu Bakr Umar, curse them. And Imam, Imam Zaid is like, curse them. I've only heard good about them from my family. So automatically, it's like a different theology. And if Al-Islam wants to do this, there's a short clip by Al, uh, Al Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, where he expresses this in a short clip, where he talks about the evolution of Shiism, where he talks about political Shiism and theological Shiism. And he links that with Imam Zaid and the later movements that come. And he mentions how early Shias were not cursing Abu Bakr Umar later Shias were, and he uses Imam Zaid as an example. So Sheikh Haider Khubullah essentially has used this as an example of Imam Zaid as an ishara because Imam Zaid's stance in history was known. And generally speaking, not all the Zaydis, but generally speaking, the Zaydis have generally kept a moderate stance of Sheikh Hain, even though at times they do have an extremist element amongst them as well at times. But generally, the stance of the Zaydis has been a bit more moderate. But regardless, we have Imam Zaid's statement himself where he clearly completely dismisses this and in fact praises them. Right, and in, in the narration it even mentions that after that, the فَغَضِبَ الْقَوْمِ the, the people became very angry at Imam Zaid for not bad-mouthing Abu Bakr and Umar and not disassociating from them and not speaking evil of them. So they thought they would go to Imam Ja'far and they said, Imam Inna Ja'far ibn Muhammad huwa ahaqqu bi al amri minka. They said, you know what, you're not worthy of the Imama then. You're not worthy of being our leader. Ja'far ibn Muhammad is more worthy. So they left Imam Zaid, وَصَارُوا إِلَىٰ جَعْفَرِ بْنِ مُحَمَّدٍ بِالْمَدِينَةِ They went to Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad in Medina, from Kufa. They went all the way to Medina to, to, to appoint Imam Ja'far as their leader and, and to get his opinion. فَدَخَلُوا وَسَلَّمُوا عَلَيْهِ So they entered and they did salam and they said, يَا بْنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ We had given bi'ah to your uncle, Zaid bin Ali, and we wanted to go out with him, but then we asked him, asked him about Abu Bakr and Umar. So he mentioned that he does not say anything about them except good. فَقَالَ جَعْفَرُ بْنُ مُحَمَّد so look at what Imam Ja'far Sadiq says and compare it with that narration of Ummu Khalida. It confirms. That's why we know, because some 
some people will say, well, you said Abu Basir is not reliable, then he's, the narration is tainted. Then how do you know the part where he's, uh, Imam Jafar is saying that do tawalla? How do you know that part is true? Well, because there are other narrations that confirm it. Like, see this one. Imam Jafar here says, Wa ana la aqulu fihima illa khaira. He said, what Imam Zaid said is no different from what I say. This is also my opinion. I do not say anything about them except good. Fattakullaha rabbakum. So fear Allah your Lord. Do you see? He, he cannot be lying in religion and saying at the same time, fear Allah your Lord. Do you see how messed up it is to say that he's lying? Because if you, if you go to a traditional Hulu influence Shia, you will say, yeah, this is Taqiyah. He's lying. <laughs> like, like seriously, he's saying, I don't say anything about them except good. In one breath, he's lying. And after lying, he's saying, Fattakullah Rabbakum, fear Allah. Well, why, don't you think someone could say to him that, why are you not fearing Allah? You are lying. <laughs> Do you see how messed up it is to say that he's lying? Na'udhu Billah. He's a Sadiq. He's the truthful one. And then he says, if you have done bay'ah to my, uh, my uncle, Zaid bin Ali, then be loyal to him and stand up for his right because he is more worthy of this affair than I am and the, uh, and more worthy of it than others because he's the one who's standing up for the political leadership of the Ummah, not me. The Imam, Imam Ja'far was content to offer intellectual leadership to the Ummah. He was not after political leadership. So the people went back to Kufa and then they resume, They went back to Imam Zaid bin Ali. And in any case, in, in other versions of this narration, it is mentioned that the people who rejected him and his stance were referred to as Rafida, as Sayyid Raza Rizwi uh, pointed out. Uh, they were called the Rafida, and they're not the only ones uh, who are called Rafida. Rafida simply means rejectors. So because they rejected Imam Zaid and his neutral, uh, moderate stance is why they became Rafida. Thank you for that, Sayyid Halir. Um, Sayyid Amir, you have the floor. Thank you. Something interesting to note is that the Ahlul Bayt actually became uh, kings in different parts of the Muslim world. For example, uh, in uh, the year 789, the Idrisis, uh, the Ali dynasty established a kingdom in Morocco, you know, and they did initiate a ritual cursing. They had the power, they were kings, you know. The Umayyads couldn't touch them. The Abbasid, no one could touch them. They were kings. They were sovereign, independent rulers. They didn't start ritual cursing. But we see when the Safavids, they came to power, they used to walk through the markets of Iran forcing Sunnis uh, to curse. Whoever didn't curse, they used to cut off their heads. They used to cut off their heads. And you know, you can see the Shirazis today, they are thanking uh, the Safavids for this. They're saying, thank you for uh, purifying our land, doing the dirty work that no one dared to do. So we can compare just with the Alawites, the Alids came to power, you know, for example, there was just one Alid uh, branch that became to, came to power, there were multiple. For example, the Idrisis in Morocco in 789, there were the Alawites in northern Iran, in the Ilam, in Yemen. And no, no one of these groups initiated ritual cursing. They no one said, come on, let's curse, let's curse. No, you will find this within the so-called converts to Shiism, the different uh, groups that converted to Shiism, for example, Iranians or different ethnicities. They were the ones that uh, initiated this ritual curse. You will never find this with the Ahlul Bayt. Thank you for that, Sayyid Amir. Uh, Sayyid Ali Haider, you have the floor. Yeah, um, um, so one of the things that we have to think about is what was the motive of a lot of this whole lot? Why were they doing these things? So we just heard so many evidences of, about how this whole uh, story of, uh, um, you know, how that Abu Bakr and Omar, uh, and Billah, trying to uh, kill the Prophet's daughter and killing her. This is all a made-up thing by the Hulat. So that part is uh, pretty well established. Um, then the question comes, the, and, and it's also well established that that story never existed until a much later time. You know? uh, so for example, up to Hazrat Zaid's time, uh, there was, this story was not in existence. It came in existence much longer. That's what a lot of the panelists have been talking about. So the question then comes that why did this story come into existence and what was the motive of those who lot to bring such stories into existence? And when they brought these stories in existence, one of the uh, isharas here is why did they pinpoint Hazrat Omar for it? Why were their stories a lot of times centering on him, on trying to uh, demonize him? So you have to take note that it was during the time of Hazrat Omar that a lot of the expansion 
Persianism happened, that was the time when, for example, the greater Persian empire crumbled and came under Islamic rule. So there were a lot of people in the greater Persian empire, which includes Kufa and Basra, you know, Mesopotamia, as well as uh, other parts of, uh, of Persia. And people were very angry with him. People who were residents of those areas, there was a lot of people who were very upset with uh, this change that the Arabs came from, from the West, west of Persia and they took over and so they had antagonism it wasn't the love of the Ahlul Bayt that that was pushing and driving the whole lot it was the enmity to Omar that was pushing and driving them and so the idea was like what can we do to take our revenge and demonize him like well there are certain historical skirmishes that have happened um, things that happened and things were buried let us unearth them make them into mountains and use those as ways to demonize. That's why you see that it's Hazrat Omar that becomes the main target of these demonizations. Now in that same vein, let me add on that if you look at the opposite side of the coin, you see a completely different picture. So how many times, if you ask the Shia population, how many people rather are going to accept or even know that Hazrat Abu Bakr was the first male convert who declared Islam, right? That's huge because during the Prophet's time when he brought the message, and then at that time, he lost his friends. Um, he's, uh, uh, he, the the, the father-in-law of his daughters, of two of his daughters, Abu Lahab, who happened to be his uncle, who is cursed in the Quran as well. Um, he ordered his sons to divorce the two daughters of Prophet Muhammad in order to cause grief to the Prophet and to unsettle him. So these were the kind of things that the Prophet was having to face when he brought Islam, that everyone was going against him very harshly. And only two people had accepted, Imam Ali al Islam, who was the first child, and then his wife, Bibi Khadija. So who was the first adult male to accept Islam? That was Hazrat Abu Bakr. And he was his friend, his very close friend, and he stuck to him. Why did he accept? Because he was very close to the Prophet. He was his very close friend. And that's why when the Prophet brought Islam, he was one of the first people to hear about it. And he conversed with him and he accepted it at a time when it was suicide to do that. And he didn't have to accept it because Hazrat Abu Bakr was a very rich man. He could have gone on with a very happy life, but he accepted it and he publicly declared it. First adult meal, right? So these are important things that are completely ignored and completely put to the side, and, and that's tragic. And if you look at Hazrat uh, Omar, you see that uh, he married the prophet's, sorry, uh, the prophet's granddaughter, the daughter of Bibi Fatima and Imam Ali, Bibi Kulthum. She was married to him. Okay, and this happened, uh, obviously, in the later period. So uh, after this whole uh, concocted so-called episode of uh, him, uh, now the Billah, murdering the Prophet's daughter. So you see that he, that happened and you see that he actually returned the income of Fadak to Imam Ali. The Shias don't know this, right? The, the income of Fadak was actually returned to Imam Ali. By who? By Hazrat Umar. He was the one who did that, right? And uh, Imam Ali named one of his sons Umar. He also married the widow of Hazrat Abu Bakr, adopted the son of Abu Bakr, and named one of his sons Abu Bakr. He also had a son named Uthman. So when you bring all these things together, you know that there's something severely wrong, terribly, terribly wrong in the popular member narratives, and that needs correction. Uh, Sister Rohtan, you have the floor. Um, I just want to yeah, congratulate everyone on, on doing an excellent job on sort of uh, unpicking this narrative really beautifully. Um, one point I wanted to make, um, which uh, I'm, I'm quoting the verse that um, Say, uh, Sayyid Haider Ali uh, quoted uh, in the last Isnad about the fact that from Surah Al-Baqarah that says that um, that was a nation which has passed on. It will have what it earns and you will have what you earned and you will not be asked about what they used to do. This is a verse that's really important, like we said, about the fact that we will not be questioned about history. But there is a caveat to this verse. So you will not be questioned about history unless you are making slanderous allegations about people with very little proof. You know, we, we talked about and, uh, you know, much of the respective panelists have already voiced about the fact that this narrative comes from one book, a book whose authenticity is incredibly doubtful. 
Now, when we think about the Quran and the amount of witnesses that you require to make severe allegations of crimes, do you think this book, this book whose authenticity is very dodgy, is going to stand up for you on Judgment Day when you have to face Allah and you have to substantiate these allegations that you made? Because that is what you might be questioned about. On, on, uh, to add to that, uh, the allegations that are often made about Umar al muminin Aisha and her virtue, again, these are very severe allegations that you are making about an individual, allegations that you have very little proof for, let alone for witnesses. So again, this is something that you might be questioned about on Judgment Day. And I really would request Shias to think about this very, very severely, because it is, it, is not, it is not a trivial matter at all. So yes, we will not be questioned about the deeds of past, uh, past believers and nations that have passed before us. But if we, if we seek out to make unsubstantiated allegations about them, then we may well be questioned about that. You know, it's very interesting that the European Human Rights, uh, um, it are the Human Rights, the court, the, Sup the Supreme Court of the Human Rights in has something known as Article 10, which is all about libel and slander. And it really has consequences. Now, if we have these consequences on earth, I don't know what these consequences are going to be uh, at, at that level when, you know, um, you'll have nothing but your deeds with you. So yeah, thank you for bringing that point up. Let me, um, let me ask the last um, question and uh, we'll close from here. Uh, so at the conclusion of this episode now, uh, I'd like to offer the panelists an opportunity to raise any other crucial points from the book um, we've been discussing tonight. Is there any other vital point or appeal that uh, Sheikh uh, Haider Hubballah has drawn attention towards, which you feel uh, merits some highlight um, or emphasis on our part. And uh, yeah, please uh, share. Oh, Sayyid Raza, you have the floor. Sorry, Brother Samir, I can imagine you probably didn't want me to do that because you probably want to close up and do your last <laughs> word. But this is a bit of an important one. And um, in, the, in the interest of objectivity and fairness, I want to represent uh, the notable Sheikh Hedra Hubullah in the correct way, even though we're trying to focus more on the Shia side, because he does such an amazing job at highlighting both the Shia Sunni, I want to make sure that I mention this point and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. So what he mentions is that he, he also invites, as he does with the Shia, he also invites the Sunni to a clear stance at the end, as the, at, 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 the, at, the, at the kind of khulasa. And um, what the criticism and the stance he says is that, you know, why is one of the greatest tragedies which befell the grandson of the Prophet and his family, kept hidden. He says that. Why is there a forgetful and indifferent attitude taken towards the event? If our slogan is indeed the love of the family and the companions, then we must be loyal to it. You know, we implore you to revive the remembrance of the Al-Bayt and the Imams of the Shia, who all of the Al-Sunnah respect, and to have a clear stance on the issue of those who oppress the Al-Bayt throughout the course of history. Those who fought, Imam Zaid fought, these Banu Umayyah, especially in the Umayyads and the Abbasids here, and, and to be fair with the prophetic household, be fair with the, um, the Al-Bayt, by condemning Yazid bin Muawiyah and his allies, you know, and instead of critiquing the stance of, as some of them have done, not all al sunnah but some of them, instead of critiquing the stance of Hussein by saying he revolted against the leader of his time. You know, he says, does anyone despise and hate Jafar, ibn, Jafar Sadiq or hate Zain al-Abidin or do all Muslims feel proud? And he says, do you, do you not see the reports in your books that the, in the books of al that speak of the Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas in a, negative, in a negative way? So, you know, there should be a culture amongst the al of being very negative towards them. But rather we see a negative of the, the Al-Sunnah, rather we see a culture in the al that is kind of semi-proud of the Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas because they get fed that, oh, they were, you know, great Islam and Islam was spreading and they've got this mixed kind of messaging going on. We're told about the Dhulm on Adul Bayt, which is very good. I'm very proud that the Shia have held on to this. And it's a very good thing that we were told about the oppression because the general Muslim population are being told, you know, Harun, Harun al-Rashid. We know Harun imprisoned Imam Musa al-Qadim. 
So you would never see us call him Al Rashid, even though as an Al Qab, I, I use it as an Urf. So what I'm trying to say is that the Sunnis also have to educate their masses and be honest and be fair with the Al Bayt and condemning these people, even if it comes past Yazid and onto Muawiya. You know, you can stay quiet on him, but at least be critical and be fair and say, look, Al Bayt were oppressed and we understand the Shia sentiment. Yeah, the Shias can go extreme and that's where we come in. But at least accept what happened and say no something went because according to hadith taqalain which is agreed upon in the ummah regardless of what meaning you take the minimum meaning is love and reverence to the adal bayt after the prophet passed away khasusan in the time of banu umayya that prophet command was forgotten and went against and forget about reverence and love they slandered cursed fought and killed them so the sunnis need to reclaim this narrative and not make this into a Shia thing. Rather, it's a Muslim thing. Allah in the Quran doesn't differentiate, but a very good point. Allah in the Quran, generally, when he talks about the Sahaba, he doesn't say Sahaba and Al Bayt. No. He says Sahaba. What does that mean? The Al Bayt are part of it. He doesn't differentiate and say, no, no, the Al Bayt, what I'm trying to say here is, we know they're different, but the Al Bayt come underneath the Sahaba. Meaning, it's a broad title, and underneath the Sahaba, you have Sahaba that are not Al Bayt, and you have Sahaba that are Al Bayt. But Allah didn't say, I'm going to mention them differently. It was one community. So we have to make sure that Sunnis come back on this issue as well. I think we Shias and Sunnis need to start coming to become Muslims. We should stop calling ourselves either Shias or Sunnis, and we should call ourselves the, the Muslims of the Prophet. I think that would that that's where we need to start, uh, inshallah. With time, uh, inshallah. It, it it will happen. Uh, Sayyid Ali Haider, you have the floor. Yeah. So, and uh, concluding, I want to point out, and uh, also uh, talking about the same issue that Sayyid Reza mentioned, I will put a caveat to it uh, that uh, we have a high responsibility. Uh, in other words, uh, we the Shia communities have a high responsibility in this matter compared to the Sunnis, and that's because even the, uh, and some of the antagonism that we might see in the Sunni communities, sometimes it points back to us. And reason is that uh, we have so monopolized Karbala, we have so monopolized the Ahlul Bayt, that uh, it sends off the vibes all around that, you know, the Ahlul Bayt, there for the Shia, the, uh, you know, the matter of Karbala, that's for the Shia. And the Sunnis are like, okay, you know, they have taken it, that's fine. We don't have to uh, do anything with it, that's their thing. You know, uh, we need to get away from that monopoly. Let me give you an, a, a quick example. In Lucknow, which is the main Shia center in India, there used to be uh, two processions coming out in Muharram for commemorating uh, Karbala. One was a Shia procession and one was a Sunni uh, procession. And what the Shia did, they were not happy that the Sunnis were partaking in remembering Karbala. So they uh, put in a protest with the government and they kind of twisted and, uh, you know, they, they, they twisted arms and uh, they did their own uh, pressures to ensure that the Sunni procession is stopped. Because it's like Imam Hussein is ours, he's not yours. You know, the Arab are ours, they're not yours. So this kind of points back to us that, you know, by monopolizing the Ahlul Bayt, we are kind of tearing them away from the community that they belong to because they belong to the general Muslim community. All of us are supposed to be one community, like you said, Brother Samir. So this, uh, in a sense, points back to us. And uh, the other thing is that, that uh, in order to start that communication, I believe that uh, this, this uh, uh, taqreeb between the Shia and Sunni is not a difficult thing. A lot of people say and feel that it's difficult, but I can tell you it is not a difficult thing. I have lived in Shia communities and I have lived in Sunni communities and I have lived in the communities simultaneously. So I have a lot of experience with this. And I can um, tell you uh, unequivocally that taqreeb between Shia and Sunni is not a difficult thing if you have a good starting point. The problem is we have in the Shia communities prevented ourselves from having a good starting point. You cannot start a dialogue with a community while you are cursing its revered personalities. You, don't, you just don't start from there. It's just impossible. You cannot start at that point. 
And you cannot start also by fudging, where on one hand, you're trying to say that, yeah, this is bad, but then like panelists have mentioned, behind closed doors, you're still continuing doing the same thing or doing it indirectly. That's also not a starting point. So pick a good starting point where you go back to the position of someone like Imam Zaid, or the position of you know, our uh, Aima alayhi salam. You know, and in the case of a lot of us, our forefathers, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Go back to their positions and the unit is automatic. I can tell you, you will have still, still have some differences, but it's okay within a family, you can have differences of opinion, but the unity will be automatic. There's only one set that's stopping that, and that's failing to have that starting point, and that is on us. That is not on the other community. Thank you so much for that, uh, Sayyid Ali Haider. Uh, Sister Roxana, you have the floor. I will just make one last very, very quick point. Um, I want to go back to something that Sayyid Ali Haider said uh, a few uh, earlier on, where he said that the Sahaba and Yahud Bayt are two legs of the Ummah. And uh, I think what has happened is that now we need both, both, both sides of this debate need to reclaim the other leg. So we need to reclaim the Sahaba as part of our Islam, and the Sunnis need to reclaim the Ahl Bayt as part of their Islam, so we both can no longer be handicapped. Thank you for that, uh, Sister Roxana. And uh, let me end with that, that we need to claim what uh, Sayyid Raza was saying, that it's about Hadith is the claim. It's about those two legs that we need to figure out. Yes, the Ashaba, the Ahlul Bayt, whenever they're mentioned in the Quran, that's how they're mentioned. So yes, we need, to, we need to go back. We need to go figure out what is the correct narrative and be who we are. And that's what we should do. Uh, we've started uh, here at Isnad and, Al and uh, Al Islam. So please do follow us. Please do subscribe because it's going to be uh, a change. And this change has to come from within us, as Sayyid Ali Haider said. Uh, thank you again very much for uh, sharing your time um, and your knowledge in this particular session. Um, and inshallah, we will see you all in the next uh, episode of Isnad. Ma'as everybody.